DJParisWalker.com. Okay. And um, this is the first in a series of interviews for DJ Legends of Birmingham. Right. Can I thank you very much for inviting me, Paris, for your very special interview? And I'd, I'd like to thank you for being the first. The first? <laughs> Excellent. <Okay. laughs> well, I wanted to. The reason why I wanted to start with you because hot off your success of Powerhouse, right? Powerhouse was the first place that I um, ever saw you DJ okay. Okay. as a child. I'm, we're talking, I was about 15, school. and we was exposed to some incredible music of the time, right? But I want you to take me back to um, when you first started DJing. How old were you when you first started DJing? Well, to be fair, um, as, far as, as far as a DJ was concerned, it was more with my brothers. Because we was involved in a reggae sound system called Lord Jacob. How old was you about that time? We were, well, I was 16, to tell you the truth. I was 16. I was the oldest brother and a group of myself, Mouty, my brother who's got a catering business out, Angie's Catering, Roy, Gary. You know, we all, and Robin Smith, who, you know, who's done very well for himself in care and everything. You know, so we, you know, we was all part of a sound system called Lord Jacob in Saltley, in, in Birmingham. In Saltley? Yeah. Back in Saltley, that's, that's the interesting to um, know that was, there was a reggae sound system from Saltley. Oh, no, there was a reggae sound system, Count, we had Count Flash. What, what sort of year, what sort of year we're, we're talking? Talk, we're talking about 76, 77. I remember as a record collection, I, I, I was a, I've always been a prolific record buyer. Mm. And what started me off in buying records, but I'm going to say it in print now. What started me off, I wanted to borrow some records off a friend and he told me the proverbial F O. Okay. And I thought, right, one day you're going to want to borrow a record off me. Whoa. So, you know, that's what started me on my journey is buying records and I was always a record buyer. And as I said, we've, I did the reggae um, sound system with my brother for about So what kind of music, what years. kind of reggae was, was roots, rocking? A, roots. Roots. So tell me um, the political landscape of Birmingham. What was you going through at that time? What was your family life like at that time in that well, 70s era? Because 76... I kind of remember it as a as a child as a heat wave year, yeah. and it was very hot, and ethnic minority people, I should say, wasn't really doing that well, well in Birmingham. Be, well, to be fair, I mean, I used to go out a lot um, with my friends at the time. We used to go to Rainbow, May, well, Mayfair, Locarno, Top Rank, okay. Boogie. No, it wasn't Boogies. It was Barbarellas then. So. Grand Hotel, oh, I remember some stories of Grand Hotel, but um, it's like, it was a really interesting time of my life where at that time, during that period, I've always loved the soul. And what used to happen, I always used to listen to Radio Luxembourg. So okay, yeah. in the, musically, I was with my friends with the record sessions and then with the soul side of it, I used to be in my bedroom with my headphones because on, listening underneath the radio, trying to find a signal to listen to Radio Luxembourg. Because the thing, the thing is, right, you started off with a reggae sound system and I could never connect how you ignited such a huge R&B, soul, R&B scene of that time. What happened was... How, how did that come, how did you make the transition from playing with your brothers with a reggae sound into this... DJ Frenchy T that we know I for start, Powerhouse. Well, put it this way, I, I fused the elements really because um, I'll never forget my first records I bought. When I was 16, I worked at Lewis's. I got my first job. I left school and I was going to go into sixth form and I got, I started working at Lewis's and Graham Waugh had a record shop and in the Oasis. 
So, as a porter working in Lucy's, every Thursday was payday. So, what happened, I would mix find the soul and the reggae. But what started me off on the soul was my friend, he used to have a sound system. No, he had a group and a, a young singer called Jackie Graham used to okay, sing in that group. I know that Jackie Graham. And um, anyway, so I went to a concert of his and it was at the, May, it was at the Mayfair. And what happened, I, for the first time I seen Errol T, the twins, I, I seen all this, uh, these guys dressing fancy and smart, the music, the vibe, the atmosphere. I thought, I was home. I thought, I, well, what I was record, home. What record, what, what particular track or tracks? Because or, I know some incredible 70s R&B came out at that time, you're talking yeah. about people like... Um, well, around 1974, 1973, 74. It was not Parliament Funk and that. Uh, no. There was a phrase called the shuffle. I was at school then. So you had things like James Brown. You had things like the Fat Back. You had things like Creative Source. You had things Eddie Hendrix. Keep on trucking. I remember practicing yeah. my shuffle into that. Wow. And um, it's like that kind of started me off. But what I kind of realised where my solely side came into it, I was always fascinated with Isaac Hayes' shaft, but more yes. importantly for me personally, was the four tops, are you man enough? Okay. And what happened, it was like, I realised that I had a certain solely side, which I, I don't know, to this day, I've maintained it with myself. So moving on, it was like when I started to so I combined buying reggae and soul during that period. So what happened anyway, when I was working at Lewis's, you know, I started to get, come away from the reggae side. And um, so my first records I can remember buying from um, Graham War Shop was um, Lonnie Liston Smith's Song for the Children on That's 7 a Inch. massive, massive classic. Pretty Dad. The John Gibbs Orchestra, if that's the right name, um, the dementia's kicked in. <laughs> oh, gosh. And um, C Cuba, you know, please forgive me for that. Gibson Brothers, and also um, there was something else. But the, the main thing about it was what it did, it introduced me to the world of the jazz funk thing because I didn't know it existed. And when I discovered it, things like um, Ronnie Harris, Gary's Gang, players associate all these sort of things i thought jeez i'm home I'm because home. because what, 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 what um, i'm getting at with um your your discovery of this music right was that birmingham in the 70s and early 80s was for, from the black community point of view was heavily reggae you couldn't really get a gig if you literally was playing reggae at that point in time so how you managed to get gigs well, what was happened, well, to tell you the truth, what really happened, um, there was a transition where you had places like um, Barbarella's, Rebecca's, where you had soul sections and reggae sections. So it was I just literally know, sectioned off for soul. Section, and, and you had like re the Mayfair, no, no, Rainbow Suites, where you had the reggae element, the heavy, like the sound system, and then they played a, a bit of James Brown or something like that. But... See, but what happened though, for my part, the disco scene came into effect around 77, 78, 78, 77, 78, 79, the disco scene, the jazz funk scene started to come into play. And now I was more and more into that. I was okay. more and more into that. And I met a young DJ who was buying records and I met a young DJ called um, At The Discory called Paul Dixon. Wow. <laughs> and Paul Dixon, Paul mixed and, with Dixon. And the thing is, is that, you know, up until this point, I was starting to go out, but I never really went out to places like Chaplin's and like anything around that time because I had I had young children, so. What, 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 what I'm getting at is that, because of your responsibilities. The responsibilities, and also in a relationship that I, I, I really 
cherished at the time. I, I wasn't really that bothered about going to clubs and all that. In that, okay. the co- kind of clubs we was going to was more like Rising Star okay. and with KKJ because KKJ used to be the D, uh, yeah Chris um, Kennedy Junior. Yeah, from, um, he was a, a disco DJ there as well disco. as playing reggae. Yeah, he was a disco DJ as well as playing the reggae. He was more on the disco side. So every Friday's Rising Star, you know that was that was a routine. So around the seventy. 70- 79 period so rising star i was still going to the reggae clubs but i was more and more getting involved with this the soul scenario so what sort of djs was around um around see, you influencing this this r and soul see the soul side of it i didn't really discover the likes of Sean Williams, Colin Curtis, Dave Till, Graham War. I knew of Graham War because I went to his record shop, but I didn't really know the other elements till around 1978, 79. That's when I really started to discover those guys. And um, my first experience of going, I wanted more of this music, and I'll never forget, I went to an all nighter. I wanted more, I wanted to know what this jazz funk scene was because I heard so much about it from my friends and I thought, right, okay then, let me go and find it. So I went to an all night at Locarno and I just was, I, I was blown away. I was just blown away. The dancing, the, the, the vibe, the style, the arrogance, you know, you had to be part of a scene and I wasn't part of that scene. So it was like, I was the outsider looking in. But I was fascinated with the scene and, you know, so I started, as far as the soul record side of it, I was really starting to buy more and more of that sort of stuff. Because um, if I sort of fast forward you a little bit to, I'm saying 1981, 82. I'll take you back. Let me take you back to 1980. With this young gentleman, this my young friend who became one of my greatest friends to this day, it's Paul McSwizzle Dixon, his name's Shaquille Dixon now. So we started off, uh, we got to communicate together. We, I'm sorry, we said, right, so we'll form um, a, a DJ group and we called ourselves the Atlantic Connection. Okay. So what we did, um, we did our we did our first promotion at Stars. You know where the dome is. Yes. We did our first promotion. There was fifteen people in there, well. and um, the big record at that time was Hiroshima Warriors. Was and awesome. records at that time it was nineteen the seventy nine show AC. So it was like that was our first launch into the DJ world. And then what happened? We started doing American parties, American bass parties okay. and so forth because his girlfriend at the time was, um, her, mother, her mother had lots of American friends and so they had parties and so forth. So that took us more and more into the, the world of soul music. And then my world was, fully devoted to the soul music. Well, how, how did you start to develop the scene? Because like, you were, cent- you were a central person to this, to this music, right? And I know you eventually went on to work at Summit Records, which is where a lot of the DJs met you. Yeah. But before then, which I said- I was nothing, no, no, to tell you the truth, I only really started to get my recognition when I started working at Summit. What happened, 1980, 1980, I remember this clearly, I got made redundant. Whoa. And um, it was about nine o'clock, went to Pizza Hut, my redundancy money with my kid and the, the missus I was with at the time, we went to Pizza Hut to celebrate or cry with my, um, <laughs> my payoff. And basically what happened about, Quarters of ten, we was walking along New Street, and I heard music playing of Temple Street. Whoa, Temple and I, Street! I, and I thought, wow, what, what's going on? What's that? So she, so I said, oh, hold on, let me go and have a look. This, is, yeah, it was about quarter to ten. So I walked up to Temple Street, and at the time, but I wasn't to know. Winston had just got back from London buying records from. To, to, to sell to everybody okay. over the weekend. So I knocked the window and says, can I buy some records? 
So invited me in and I bought, I think, five or six records. And then what happened, I left, you know. And who I was seeing at the time, she said, well, why don't you ask for a job? I said, yeah, he ain't that. He doesn't need me, you know, why does he need me, you know? He says, well, ask him for, he can only say yes or no. Yeah, so true. I went back, I knocked the window, and I did my Yasser Hughes, and I says, uh, do you have a job? I've lost my job, well, you know, I told him I got made redundant. And I says, I'm, I'm looking for work, do, do, do you have any employment? And he says to me, no, nope. um, he's just filled it up. And he gave it to a friend of mine called Jerry Shillingford. Okay, I know Jerry. <laughs> well. So what happened anyway? He says, "No, but you know what? Come and see me on Friday." This was October. This was October 1980. He says, "Come and see me on Friday." And at the time, I was buying records from DNS Co. as well, Sean Williams shop and Dave Tiller shop. Mm. And um, so I came on the Thursday. So I started working part time Thursday, Friday, Saturdays with him. After two weeks, I, I became a full-time member of staff, and then that's when you started to. That's when um, the whole the legacy, to the legacy started but, to but know. I'm gonna put. I'm gonna, I'm gonna. You might not remember this, but in 1982, and I keep saying that year is because that was the first time I ever set foot in Summit Records, and I came into your record shop. Right, it was Temple it, Street. It was Temple Street, and um, the guy says. I says, so where's all this jazz, funk and hip hop and R&B and all this stuff? Oh, it's downstairs and a guy called Frenchie. And that was, I think the probably Trevor, Winston. Winston, was probably Winston. Probably, probably Winston or Trevor, because there was Trevor and Winston there. Trevor's upstairs, Winston was yeah. So I said, okay, let me go downstairs. And I went downstairs, I saw you and, and a 12 year old DJ Paris Walker, right? Went up to her, I says, so what have you got? Right? And, and you go to me, but, so what do you like? And I says, I like break dance. Ah, I've got a record for you. And you pulled down an import version of African Bombata's Soul Sonic Force, Planet Rock. Okay. Right. And um, I said, well, how much is that? And he told me some ridiculous process. Was it, oh, was it, import? Import? it was an import. It was an import. I, I, I didn't know, at the time I didn't know about imports and whether records are straight from America or records released here. Yeah. I said, and you got it cheaper. And he goes, well, you, do, you don't really want that. You said, to me, you don't really want that version of the cheaper one. I says, well, I've only got like four or five quid on me, man. You know what I mean? So you pulled down a Polydor version of, Planet, of African Bombata Soul Sonic oh, Force. Okay. And I bought the seven inch version of it. And I went home, right? And I was so happy, right? And the first gig I ever played as a, as a, as a schoolboy, right? I did a youth club and I played that record and it smashed the place. And that started my career as a DJ. Okay. Well, to be fair, on my side, what happened was that because I was in a position where I was starting to see a lot of DJs promote and so forth, I didn't want to be a DJ because I wanted to be everybody's friend. So for me, it was more important to be everybody's friend and not to be competition with people. So anyway, a young promoter from Preston came down and he said to me, because the Lacana all days at that time had just finished. Yes. Well, not, had finished about two years. And he came up to me, hence, you know, the history on this show. Yes. <laughs> right, so... Uh, <laughs> so, so basically what happened, um, he said to me, Tony, if you can help me with a club, I will look after you. Now, at this time, I'd nicked my, nicknamed myself Frenchie T. Because what I did, I, I pirated my name of this London DJ, Sean French. Okay. So I wanted to, so to define the two of us, because my name's Tony, I thought, right, Frenchy and T for Tony. And I didn't think anywhere I'd be known or anything. I, did, I didn't think of anything like that. So anyway, so Frenchy T was born to the Ordea scene at Max Millions. That was the first time when I was, started mm. to become DJ on the old day circuit. And I helped Kenny to get like Max Millions. We did two all days there, then it went to Snobs, then it went to Romeo's and Juliet. Then, Romeo then changed its name to Steptoes. Mm. Then it went to the Powerhouse. Yes. The Powerhouse, well I'll tell you more about that in a while. Then, I, as a promoter, I also promoted the Hummingbird All Dayers with Tony Bing and mm. Elliot Brown. 
And basically what Asa says, during the period from the Maximilians to the powerhouse, I built up a reputation as a DJ, traveling all over the country. And as a young person, as a young man, I, I wanted to beat this drum about Birmingham because I was a bit of a rebel. Yes. I must admit, I was a bit of a rebel behind the scenes, mm. not in front of it, behind the scenes. And I'd managed to gather interest from London in regards to Blues and Soul magazine, where I, I wanted to promote Birmingham, I wanted to promote the Midlands to say we had this scene, why is it nobody taking no notice of it? And so I received a letter one day from Blues and Soul to say, we are happy to, because what I used to do, I used to write letters, reports I'll say, and send it down to them. And um, I was given, I had a, a letter and I was given to the gig to say, you have, ne we thank you, we are proud to announce that, you know, you are now a contributor for Blues and Soul for the Midlands area. Wow. So that kind of started things off for me. There was a young um, editor from London for the Black Echoes magazine, Lindsay okay. Wetzker, and he used to travel up and down the country, you know, and so we got kind of friendly with him because like, with all your day of him, because he noticed, even though that the music was like electro and funk and so forth, what you have to remember at that time, you had a, a, a jazz room, yes, but, it, but everything was played in one room in regards to the soul, the, jazz, the funk, the electro, the hip hop, everything was played in one room. Okay. But, that's, but that's another topic, <laughs> that's another okay. topic. But um, at that time, you, you know, even like with the, with house coming in, but that's more later, so I'll come back to that at a later time, but the scene started to grow where you had like 200 people, 300 people, 500 people, coaches coming from all over the country. This scene was exploding. Yeah, because I, would, I went down there, right, the record that I could associate what stampeded the dance floor, what you used to play, was Nucleus Jam On It. Do you remember that record? Okay, I remember. Do you remember well, how big Jam On It, Jam On It, things like um, Johnson, Grew, Johnson Crew, things like the Smurf, but also you had things like Wolf Ticket, you also had things like Stone. And at that period, during that time, those records, you know, Pleasure Glide, you yes. know. So you had cult records, you had cult records. And, and you were the man to break those records to young DJs coming up like myself. I was fortunate because I was in a position where I worked in a record shop and because I had the double head of a DJ stroke working in the record shop, mm. I could introduce people. So certain people trusted my judgment as far as our records was concerned. And, you know, it's kind of like held me in good stead. And I found that... But not only that, not only that is... The dancers, the dancing scene, you spawned, well, I, I kind of credit it to you because the music that you was playing inspired those people to get together, Duracell Posse and well, all what, these other what, what crews I, back what, what, in, in the old days. They literally came there to dance. But see, the thing is, you're talking about the Duracell people, but they were the generation, a few generations down. Realistically speaking, the generation spawned from, said, like the... Chaplins, the Rumrunner, the early Locarno, you had like a, a nucleus there and then it evolved into say like the generation with like Bulldog and your know, Robert Johnsons and your Lizards and Stretches and all these sort of people. There was another generation and also dancers like Rico and so forth on the yes. jazz side. So that those two generations was way before the Jewish cell. The Jewish oh, cell okay. was much later. Was much later. So during the all day period, you, what you did, you had you had a nucleus of people that was starting to form. So as a DJ, going out to all these different things, because I was fortunate enough organizing coaches with Shaquille. Mm. We was fortunate enough, and we had like DJs Chris Reed as well, who's we was part of a nucleus, a Birmingham nucleus. We was going all over the country. And it was like, as soon as Birmingham went into certain air, clubs, venues, 
the Birmingham, as soon as Birmingham came in, they lit up the damn floor. They just went straight on the floor yes. and they started. The party yes. had started. Yes. Nottingham, everybody all over the country, at one stage, they was called it French's Army. They're mm -hmm. coming in, starting the party. Yes. And to be fair, those are special times because looking back, I didn't realise that things like with the old day scene at that time where you had like the powerhouse now, I'll bring into the powerhouse now, where the powerhouse became the pinnacle of the build up of all those of all days that I mentioned. Yes. The very, so that, that, these were the, the building blocks. That was the building blocks. To so what yeah, the powerhouse became. Yeah. The, the powerhouse for that scene at that time became the pinnacle venue for the all day scenes. Well, nationally, well, in the Midlands anyway, because then what you found, you had, whether it be every two weeks or whether it was Birmingham, Rock City, Birmingham, Rock City, Birmingham, Rock yes. City. So, you know, those two venues, you know, somebody mentioned it quite recently that they never realised how important that scene was at that time no, but what <laughs> happened was that america had paradise garage america had um studio 54 fair enough we had our certain things like we've rum runner but the powerhouse was our paradise garage yeah because, because what it was, was jazz funk you literally had a jazz room where there was like that small. What you it, was, it, wasn't, it? it wasn't even just a jazz funk. It, what it was, it was a mixture of a combination of lots of music, whether it be jazz, electro, for all the mixtures, there was a lot of music. And what it was, people was coming out to dance every Sunday. It was a yes, ritual. Yes. It was a ritual, yes. so it was like, can you imagine, you're talking about young people who weren't really working, some people, I don't know how they managed, you had the, I call it the taxing crew, the town crew, yes. where they made their own money to, yes. to attend these venues. But the thing is though, the crux of it really was that this scene captivated and captured the imagination of a country not yes. so you had all these pockets in manchester you had these pockets in sheffield glasgow would it be fair to say that it's the building blocks of the scene that is what we have now probably on a more commercial scale well, well you've got to look on it like this the dance scene came from the all day scene it was an offshoot because if you think about it the rave parties um things like um Money pennies, things like um, Starlight, things, all those underground parties. Part of that was influenced by the all day scenes where, you, you know, people go into um, farms or barns or mm. warehouses and so forth to hear music. Now, but that was a different generation. Now, this, now Powell, so I, want to, I want to stay on Powell for a minute because I've seen on the t shirt there, you've got Tom Brown. Gene Khan, Cameo, was there records that you are close to your heart? As, no, no. Or I, was there the records that just rocked the crowd? There was, a record that, there was the artist of the period, because if you go through the names, you know, you have your Lonnie Liston and Smiths, you know, mm. that record was a cult record inside. And I mean, to be fair, some of these records, as DJs, as pointers or whatever, we've heard them a million times. But the thing is though, when they came out, they made, a, they was groundbreakers. Yes. They was game changers at that time. So, you know, we may be bored of listening to them now and so forth, but at that time when they came out, they were mm. game changers. And like with Powerhouse, the very first PA, the very first um, event, it was a super club. Mecca decided to open a super club and the promoter, John Tully, who ran a first night at the Crown and Cushion, he got this venue, the Powerhouse, the, which was the revamped, redecorated super club, um, the old Locarno, mm. and it was like lasers. It, there, was, there was nothing like it in Birmingham. Yeah, there was nothing. Lasers, sound, the, the sound system, it, it was amazing. Absolutely amazing. And what happened is that you had that first time, that first event, 
a record just came out, David Joseph, but it was on it was on a um, promo at the time, but it came out. It was creating a massive stir. And he was the very first PA at the Paris all day. And basically what happened, I can I can remember it clearly. The atmosphere, people was excited. You, you gotta think about lots of street kids, mm. young kids. It even, and it was quite multicultural as well. It was well. very multicultural. Everybody from every race was there. It's multicultural and, you know, they would, they embraced this event called the Jazz Room Call Day because what happened, it started off in the Bally High, in the Jazz Room, in the small room, mm. and it used to be the Northern Soul in the big room, but now it was like the big room was for the Jazz Funk parties and the small room became the, the Jazz Parties. Mm. But it started, I think it was 1983 it started, but it started a generation, a golden era in, forgive the expression, black music on a national scale. And bearing in mind as well, none of this music was getting played on the radio at that time, was it? Not really. You, you only had pockets of music being played because of what on was main, happening. On mainstream radio, like at the time there was BRMB, there was obviously Radio yeah, 1. But you never I agree, heard nothing yeah, like that. I agree with you, I agree with you. It just exploded. And if you think about it for over a period of say 83 to 86, probably 87, yeah. those was the golden period of... Era. So, and then when the house side started where you had, if I remember right, the, like this, oh God, um, Jack, Chippy, Funk, yeah. Jack, oh God, I'm trying to think of the label. Again, Shaquille, mm. he used to work with Street, yeah. street Sounds Records. Yeah. So, oh, the Chicago label, I can't remember, I should remember, but, <laughs> um, but the thing is though, that the house, Part of it stage. came into it, it came into it, and it created another scene which, with Pirate Radio, then started to bring that into a fore. Mm. But it was a golden era, and I must admit, I'm glad to be a part of it. Well, that, that, that scene there, it, it went to, obviously went to Hummingbird, and there was. Well, there with was Hummingbirds, all what happened with the Hummingbird? I, I was the actual, with Tony Bing and another friend, Elliot Brown, I was the actual promoter of the Hummingbird all days. You was promoter of the Hummingbird? I, was the I, did, I never promoter. knew that. I, never, I thought I was thought it was another um, no, promoter. No, no, no. What happened, um, Lloyd came to me at some... This is Lloyd Blake? Yeah, Lloyd Blake came to me and he, he said to me... He was a manager of Hummingbird at this time. Yeah. And he says to me, he would like to have all days, a jazz from called days at the Hummingbird. And because of my friendship with Lloyd, I had to do it. So it meant for a period of time, I broke away from the Paris all days to support Lloyd. And I think we did Kenny G, we did people like um, Morrissey Mullen, Onward International. You brought in a slave. whole load of artists. A lot of artists, from the, what I noticed about when the, the all days went to the Hummingbird is a lot of artists whose career probably was washed up at that time. Like I'll give you an example, Betty Wright, Washed mm. up at the time, but the record, because it was played in Birmingham, it was that yeah. big that you was able to bring her to the Hummingbird so, for an event. See, what happened was that Lloyd had a philosophy. He said that, look, this is a black music venue. It is our culture, our right to have black music played in a black music club. And he fought so hard whether people liked him or not, he fought so hard for, for black artists to have a platform in Birmingham City Centre. And he did do that. He, he did, did he do did that. Do, yeah, 100%. So, you, you know, under a variety of restraints, you know, he couldn't maintain the venue. But, but the one thing he did do, he did a fulfil a promise where people like Gil Scott Heron, people, you, you know, people from all over the world, Curtis yeah, the, Mayfield yeah, and so public forth, Academy, they came, they NWA came. NWA came there. Mary you know J. Mean? Bly. Mary J. Bly, R. Kelly came, came there, love him or hate him now, but people, he was there. People came, yeah. artists came, and there was a venue, a black venue for black music artists. And okay, it couldn't maintain it, but you know, in the short space of time it was open, 
it did fulfill a purpose. And so when your day is seen, now in 84, coming to 85, music had started to change in a way where the accessibility was starting to become more open. Mm. A, again, another gentleman, his name was Cecil Morris. Yes. He came to Summit Records um, and he says, look... Cecil I'm, Morris of PCRL yeah. Radio. Yeah. He said to me, right, um, I'm putting together a radio station. I'd like to have you as one of my sole presenters on the radio station. And also he spoke to Trevor Ranks to mm. do the, one of the regular programs. So the original PCRL set was six DJs. It was so myself. So you were literally the very first yeah. pirate radio I, I, DJ. I, I was the third presenter on PCRL. So we had Rodney J, there was six of us. Rodney J, music master Cecil himself, Orlando M, Stones, Daddy Trevor Stones. Ranks, yes. and me. So, so six se presenters. Six, six of us wow. that started on the on my birthday, the twenty third of May, nineteen eighty five. Nineteen eighty five. So that's when we first started PCRL, and what happened was that as the popularity of pirate radio, because what happened, London was already up and running with pirate radio. Yeah. yeah. So Birmingham had it, and like with the raids, and to be fair. Cecil, I think he was underestimated. He, he, people have underestimated the impact that he made in the Birmingham music scene. No, he had a massive impact on the... Um, for, for DJs like myself, he well, had a massive impact had, on the um, music scene with PCR. It, it blew us away that someone was brave enough to step out and start to broadcast black music in well, that way. Well, the thing mm. is, though, how I would put it as well was that he gave in Birmingham black music a platform, but also as well, there was a lot of diversity in yes. putting that music because he was raided, he went to courts, he was fined, the threats of prison. And, you know, there was a lot what he, he stood up, faced the company saying, well, look, hang on, the country, you know, the, the media and so forth, look, we needed to present music our music in our own form and, and at that point in time he wasn't allowed to do that it wasn't allowed but he still, he still in the face it. of adversity in the face of like the for the love of music as well mm. he did it and you know whatever um accolades that should be given that he should have the, the, the first person i would give i'd raise two hands to is Winston Gordon Summit Records. There is nobody on this planet I can give. Would you say that he was your mentor, he, he, Winston? Winston Gordon, it, musically for me, was the most important person. For what was me. his knowledge of music? Was he more reggae? Because I always saw him as this more reggae orientated sort of guy who came to you for advice. No. But, but no. it was the other way around. Winston's music knowledge was very diverse. His favourite music. His favourite musician was Jimi Hendrix. Jimi Hendrix? Yep. That's, that's surprising Jimi to Jimi Hendrix hear. was his favourite artist. He could tell you every album, every track on every Jimi. He had the complete collection of Jimi Hendrix. Wow. With the reggae side of it, he had gathered himself a, a reputation as a, as a uh, promoter, but also as well what he did. He had a shop in Wolverhampton called The Hip Factory before yes. he started Summit Records. Yes. And himself and Don Christie, again, I have so much admiration for Don Christie. He, the two of them, even though you had all the other, um, like Quaker City Zion and all that, when they had record shops and Black Wax and all that, Don Christie and Winston at Summit Records came to Birmingham City Centre. Yes. And even though you had Bailey's records, they brought music into black music to a different form. They, they were the all the As a DJ coming up, they were the only places to go for music. If you wanted up to date, up from reggae, hip hop, or R and B, or house, mm. or any of the genres that we just mentioned, Dan Christie's and Summits was the places to go. And yourself, obviously, 
and the and RB the yeah. and Trevor Ranks and um, Trevor, even, um, Lenny, Everton. It was Lenny, it was Lenny, it was Lenny at um, yeah. Don's and Don himself. Yes. But Pirate Radio, I have to say that. Did that help the sales of music at that time? Because, oh, God, yeah. Because selling yeah. music now, right, one track that I would say I, I accredited, accredited you for moving as, as, as far as retail is concerned was on Vogue, hold on. See, but on Vogue I, was more later on. I know it was see. later on, yeah. but, on it, but it was a, a record that it... It was they were unknown, completely unknown, and mm. it, it was an import record, and it just it was like an underground record that took off. See, so, see, so my take on that is that you have lots of different records that could have I call icon records. One, of, the first one I would say would have been Kenny Burke, Rise Rising to, the, to top. the Top. The second one I would have said would have been Chaka Khan, Ain't Nobody. The next one, even though you had lots of records in between that, but in Birmingham. I had the privilege of having one of only three copies in the country of Sahara's Love So Fine. Oh my God, I remember that record. So it was like, it was a nice pat in the back for me. And it was my birthday and all that kind of stuff. But the thing is though, as I says, moving on, I was personally driven to wanting to promote a dance, a soul and dance station in Birmingham. Mm. So I'm, I know it's quite legendary, me and Cecil's doing, arguments yeah. at Peace R. And you moved to get fresh. <laughs> so it was like, I just, I just thought, you know what? I'm, I just wanted to have a, I wanted it to be, I wanted a soul station. Mm -hmm. So when I first, so when I left Peace RL, I left there. How long did you stay at Peace Hotel just before you? I was at Peace Hotel from 1985 to 1987. So you spent, two, spent two years. Spent two years. And then, funny enough, I was in a station, I formed a station called SCR with um, Don Christie, Second City Radio, Tony Owens, Ricky from Delegation, Ricky Bailey from Delegation, Uncle Sam. Um, there were six of us. Myself, there's so many. Uncle Sam, Don Christie, Tex Flint. Tex yeah. Flint? Yeah, wow. Tex Flint, yeah. yeah. So we formed. He was the organizer of the Birmingham Carnival as well. So we organized Second City, and really, that didn't really. Through a variety of different things, it didn't really last that long as how we wanted it to. And then I broke away, and, f and funny enough, the engineer I'd used was, I was quite close friends with um, Tony Monson and we used the engineer for Soul Radio. Okay. So, and then when I'm I set up Fresh FM with my mate, Mike Paul, he, 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 I just didn't want to know nothing. I was burnt out with music. I hated music with well, a passion. By that time. <laughs> and, um, but we, he talked me into setting up a, a weekend station and I used Gordon Max engineer at that time. And, um, I must have had a lot of fun. But with it had that a, station. but it had a massive that for just for it being a weekend station, Fresh FM, that had a massive impact on the scene as well because well, it ignited it, other well, DJs. Fresh FM them. was the first proper black music and dance station in Birmingham. What motivated? What, what was your motivation to to? Um, my, my motivation was I wanted to sh show London that Birmingham had a scene. I started to lose interest in music because of one reason or another. Around 1991, 92, I, I, I just had enough of music. So I, I didn't want to know. So I actually came out of music for, for, God, for nearly 18, 19 years. I lost wow. interest. And what happened, I, I, I started to enjoy music as a punter, going out having a drink, but also as well, I'd always had a love for the soul for house and the house scene. Yes. I always loved, I always said to myself, if I could have played anything, I wish I could play the house song. And what happened, I was approached by Dave VJ and Lindsay Wesker in 2011, or 2010 actually, in contributing to a book called Master of the Airwaves, which was realistically, a biology about the black music radio, pirate radio scene of the 80s 
mm. 80s, 90s, and they wanted different contributors, and I was asked, and I said, yeah, I'd love to do it. So what happened, I did that, I, I, I sent my contribution, and I said to them, if ever you was gonna do a promotion, a, a radio promotion around the country, let me do Birmingham, let me do Birmingham. And what happened, that was around 2011, and when the book was finally released, I think it was released 2012, when it was finally published. So what I did, I took the book to promote, because the London launch, originally the launch was going to be done in Birmingham. Okay. Then they changed it to London. And what happened, um, I thought, right, if I, I'm going to promote it like this, I'm going to go around and connect with like to Mike Shaft, uh, Colin Curtis, all these people who are part of the music scene. And I'd go around the country with the book, taking pictures, and, so, and, and it started to give me a buzz. And at that time, I was I was a regular going to like all the all dayers, not all dayers, sorry, the weekenders, yeah, the weekenders and, yeah. and different sort of music scenes, different sort of music scenes. So connecting with my music past, I started to get a buzz. I really started to get a buzz. And what really did it for me was hanging around for two um, weekenders with the My Soul crew. See, My Soul from London. We, yeah, hanging around with them in at at the week at the Southport weekenders, watching how they did. Things. You did a radio show for them as well, didn't you? I did a, a guest spot. I did a guest spot for them. And what happened? I started. I never realised. I I missed music. I, I had that bug again, and I thought, okay then, so it was, I think it was Minehead 50 or 49, and I came back from that, I was buzzed out, and I thought, because at the time I was really good friends with a friend, Dave Simpson, who did a magazine called Soulmate Magazine, oh, Okay. and he gave me lots of vibes, lots of vibes, and I thought, right, I need to, I need to get back into music, so I thought, I came back and I wanted to set up a radio station. I wa that was it, I, I got the bug. And, because um, I wanted to do the radio station to promote the, the book launch. Mm. So I went to see Dennis at Radio Sandwell. Dennis on Constructive Trio. Yeah, and he opened the door, because I went to do an advert. Mm. He opened the door and all of a sudden, I went back 20 plus years and I seen myself it wasn't Dennis that was in front of me. It was myself that was in Whoa. front of me. And I remembered everything what happened when I ran a radio station. And I said, no way was I going to do a radio station again. No way. So... Was it the stress of DJs and, and every, egos? No, no, no. And I think I had the longest record for being a DJ on a pirate radio. 23 hours. And the engineer came in. I was playing records for 23 hours. Wow. Just trying to keep the station going. The engineer came. You're getting let down with by a lot of DJs. And he, he seen me asleep on the decks, and I thought, uh, and he, <laughs> you, you need to go home. Yeah. <laughs> but and um, I thought, no, I don't want that no more. So I asked me if I could be a presenter. And the 27th of April, 2014, the VIP lounge at the Kitten Club was formed. Well. That's when it was formed. And, and that, that has become an iconic show of a different, because you, you've syndicated the show to yeah, lots of different stations yeah. there as well. And you've built up a massive social media audience. I'd, I'd like to think I have. Well, I'd like to yeah, think well, I have. The success of, of Powerhouse alone, and um, people listen to your style of DJing and the DJing of that era, yeah. to See, me, um, See, the thing is, I was always, is, and, and you're, you're going to be an advocate of this, I was always influenced by American music. That was my passion. I know about with UK artists, and the, but I, I was brought up on all the greats of the American artists, and it's, it's part of my DNA. You, who's your, when you, what, I know there's probably lots of favourites, but yeah. who's a favourite of us? A, over the decades, who that you come back no, to? I'll, I'll go for a couple, but it's all because of styles. Female, Patty Austin, Gladys Knight, Chaka Khan's my queen. Chaka Khan. 
on the on and the you got you was you involved for getting it to to with what was the dome to it's now O2 institute no O2. i wasn't but she actually it, came and yeah you were yeah. there no i wasn't there you I wasn't there. no i wasn't there i didn't go i didn't go but what happened with um we've so she was well chaka khan she was my favorite and then for male artists i have to say people like um lon listen smith Luther, Luther Vandross, Luther. Luther. You know, he 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 was such an iconic part of my life. But also, like people like Gary Taylor, Phil Perry, things like that. But also, as well, I have a love for jazz as well. Mm. So I'd like to think I'd have quite an eclectic taste. But like coming later on into the years, especially when I started the Kim Club, I wanted to play house because I never had the chance to play it mm. when I was doing but, it. But you spawned a lot of house DJs. Uh, with the record uh, shop. With the record uh, shop, because you, shift work, and you had obviously Crystal Force with Andy Playboy. Ward. Andy Ward. Obviously, Andy Ward had obviously them. gone off the Richter scale. And, you know what I mean? To name me some DJ because a lot of DJs are coming to the business because of you. Because they've been to your record shop, they started as a collectors. Yeah. And then they became DJs because of your influence. Well, I'd like to think where I, I look at people, I, I see like the young generation, I see like um, E Double D, I see. Um, and E Double D was Ward. a regular, he ended up working at the record shop as well, didn't I he? Know. <laughs> I know. E Double D, Andy Ward. I see young people like. Um, what about Dr. Funk? You, you, you Dr. I worked with him. I do- Cash, you know, when it came to radio, you know, of every of everybody on the radio, if I was to look at somebody who was kind of like my boy as far as like the radio was like cash will always be very special to me as far as like radio was concerned. Like with the effort, the energy and the 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 what we tried to do to make a radio station. And I'll never forget how I got how we, we got into getting him onto the radio I station. Really, let's run through that quickly. Well, he came to me. I was waiting. This is for, Cash Ricks. Yeah, Cash Ricks. I was waiting for a train at New Street's train station, and he came up to me and says, "French, you know, I, you know, because he used to write letters to Kenny B and on Peace Roll. This is on Peace Roll." He says, we haven't got enough hip-hop on Pirate Radio. We ain't got enough hip-hop. And I was in the process of setting up um, Fresh FM. SCR. Was it SCR? Sec- Se- Second, Second City. City. And he says, you know, we, we need some more hip-hop on the radio. And I says, well, if you want more hip-hop, why don't you do it? I'll <laughs> give, you know, I'll, I'll give you this, you know, you can work for me. And we'll, you can have your hip-hop, you can do as much hip-hop as you want. And that's how we started working together on wow. Pirate Radio. Wow. But um, you know, even like when when with the Money Penny, I have to give a massive shout out to Jim Ryan and Michael and Lee at the depot who went on to become Money Pennies. Yes. Because with them, I used the depot as their mailing address for the pirate stations. Wow. And they didn't need it because it could have it could have got custom problems, yeah, but yes. they did it. And you know, I'll always be grateful to those guys, even though they're West Bromwich Albion fans. But <laughs> uh, you know, I'll always be grateful to them. So you know, my path with lots of different people, different DJs, different promoters, seeing change, scenes change. You know. It's been quite a journey. It's been quite a journey, and so now so with the are you radio, surpri- are you surprised that um, this powerhouse reunion has brought so many people from all different walks of life to well, what this happened? era of twenty twenty? Well, what happened? I mean, with the radio station, I tried to do a variety of uh, promotions, like I did a, pro- a couple of dinner and dances, tried to do um, awareness of and also try to raise money for organisations. But, you know, it was a case where it was it was hard. It was a hard struggle. And I was quite surprised that we've seen ro- rises of, like, reunions, a variety of reunions. And I thought, you know what? <laughs> no, there was a few people who'd done the Powerhouse reunion, 
But I thought, you know what, let me do it. I, I, I fancy giving it a go. Mm. And I think you can, because it came from you, because people knew it was you and you was a DJ there, not people who were just trying to say powerhouse because they went to the event, but people I, I and don't DJs. Know. I, I really don't know why it took off. I really, really don't know why it took off because when I put it together, there was lots of things going on What I didn't have what I really wanted, but when I did put it together, and started the promotion of it. I set up a page for, on Facebook with it, and I don't know, it just caught people's imagination. I don't know why. I really, really don't know why it caught the imagination. And I, it started from May, um, started from May 2019, and I let everybody know in June that the 30th of November, this reunion about the Birmingham Powerhouse, I was, I was doing it. Well, I, I didn't say I was doing it. I, was just, I just kind of kept in the background, mm. but I got it all going out. I announced it 30th of November, Birmingham Powerhouse. And I don't know, it just happened. It was a bit of a, a, a rollerball where the face, people was talking about it, people was you know, saying, get this power, all can it was And I thought, wow, there's me planning just one room. Who you did know. you have on the bill for, the, for, the, for those events? The, for the for first the, event? Yeah, for the first reunion. The first event was virtually, oh, I had in the boogie room, now I'll go to jazz room because it's easy to remember, Chris Reed, Colin Parnell, and the very first one, but he, he never had, God, it's because of the date change. But um, Riven, Chris Rivendock, Chris Reed from the both who mm. was on the Paris with me, Colin Parnell, and Killer Jim from Nottingham. That was the jazz room. The funk room was Bruce, Shaquille Bruce Dixon, Q. Bruce Q, Shaquille Dixon. Or Paul um, Dixon was a Dixon, as people know, knew him at as. that time. But yeah. he's a Muslim, Muslim there. <laughs> Kenny B and also <coughs> Kenny Fitzroy. B from the Sheik Squad. Yeah. Kenny B. Yeah. Then Fitzroy, who the Fitzroy from the Soul of Survivor magazine mm. and Simon Schoolboy Phillips. That was that, okay. that was the first DJs. Simon Schoolboy S Phillips from Nottingham. Leicester. 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 The, oh yeah, Leicester. Yeah. It was it's one step ahead of from Nottingham. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So those are my DJs. And what happened, it wasn't the DJs that made the event. It was the magic of going back in time, remembering our youth, remembering friends, because we'd lost a lot of friends yes. over the years. But did you see original I, I, I faces from, did you, when you was going through the crowd, did you see faces from that era? Well, older, as, but obviously the older self. Well, speaking about the event itself, I was shocked about the response to it. I was really shocked. And so I thought, what I'll do to make it extra special I'm going to reach out to certain artists to make it special and I didn't announce it. So I, I managed to sort out Carl from Loose Ends. Whoa. I managed to sort out Lester from Atmosphere, Dancing Whoa. in Outer Space. Whoa. <laughs> and, I, and because I was, I actually managed How projection. How did you find Atmosphere? I had the resources to find. Yeah. Yeah. And Doreen from Projection as well, because I used to yes. manage them. Wow. So people, there's a lot of things people don't realise what I was involved in. And what happened, so I didn't announce it that they was coming. I just wanted everybody to come on the back of the Powerhouse reunion. So on the night, it, I was really, really amazed. I mean, I couldn't, I didn't enjoy it myself because... You're never going to enjoy it as a no, promoter because no, you, you're, you're too organizing. much going down it, yeah. But looking down at the crowd, watching the bodies moving and the and the, the 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 appreciation of the people, people hugging people that because I've seen in years. I wanted I wanted to come myself, but yeah. I, I, because of work commitments, I couldn't be there. But I was there because the social media, I know, uh, right, I know. made me be there because yeah. everybody was filming it and it I, was just I was shocked. incredible and like. I was thinking, this really took off. And I saw faces that I knew from yeah. who used to go, when I used to go to Powerhouse back in well, the day. Well, what was, what was amazing for me was um, 
one of the DJs for Fitz, well actually, but Fitz, he says, London has not got nothing like this. And people were saying that, I mean, they were saying that it was like, this was what one of the best night outs for the decades. Yes. And uh, again, I couldn't see because you know. Well, the pe- the comments that I've seen yeah. on social media said it spoke for itself, and yeah. it was obviously a phenomenal night. One thing I want to, um, because I want to try and wrap it, wrap it. Yeah, up, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, um, yeah. your career spanned from the seventies up until 70s, now. With yeah. a break, obviously yeah. your tip breaks. Yeah, yeah. With yeah. a break, but yeah. it spanned this era where you've. You've been a club promoter, you're a DJ, you've sold the music in a retail fashion, you've managed artists, um, you've been motivated to mentor other DJs mm. as well over the years, right? Mm. In your words, what does it take to become a DJ? Of any, I don't want to say successful because that can mean a lot of things yeah. for a lot of people, financial. I, 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 just, I, I just think a that... A DJ, what's... The, the name that you have, a synonymous name in, in, in a city like Birmingham. I, I don't know if I've got a good name or not. <laughs> I don't know about that. Believe me, you wouldn't, you, you wouldn't be here I, if you, if you wasn't. I don't know about that. But um, the one thing I would always say is just be yourselves. Enjoy what you do. You have to embrace the business side of it because, I mean, I didn't really embrace the business side of it. Oh, if I did, I would have done things a lot better, a lot better. But I think you need to embrace the business side of it. You need to embrace the current trends as well because things are forever moving. So you need to embrace that as well. And if possible, stay political correct. You can't please everybody all the time, but try to please most people. Just, you know, so that's what I would say because, like, you, you, it's one of those industries where you can absolutely love it, but you can absolutely hate it as well. So it's, it's good to have thick skin as well because you're going to need it as well. So enjoy, and if anything, you know, try and set yourself goals where you want to achieve things within it. Would you say in your career that you've achieved, I'd say at least 80% of the goals? No, 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 uh, no, definitely not. I, I don't, all I would say is that I was fortunate to experience a lot of nice things. I was fortunate to experience a lot of positive things but I've also experienced a lot of bad things as well which wasn't nice so that kind of like it it gives me a balance of not going crazy over certain things so Mm. this Paris reunion it's it's brilliant and so forth but it's also measured as well in Mm. my own personal appreciation of it what happens to it tomorrow next year the year after, I really don't know. I really okay. don't know. Where do you see your career? You're you're back in the music scene. You're DJing on various. You radio show syndicated in a lot of different stations. Where do you see your career going now? Are, are you, is your career is your future in radio mostly, or where do you see it going? No. Are you still going to continue with? I, I, um, I prefer to term it a different way. I prefer to term it that. As far as music is concerned, as far as I just want to try to maintain a love. If I can maintain a love for it, then however long it lasts, then I'll enjoy that journey. If if that time comes, which it will come, when that time comes where, you know, I've had a good innings, because I've had a good, a good innings, especially with the rebirth, I didn't expect it. But I've had a good innings, and so, you know, at least I can look back, and I think also as well, at least I have, like, the shows where, if I put them all up on YouTube now, they'll be forever there. Mm-hmm. You know, I can, I've, I've mm-hmm. left a legacy. Good, bad, indifferent, I've left well, a legacy. Well, I, 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 I would like to think that I'm part of your legacy as a DJ that was influenced by your skill as a DJ and your knowledge of music in the R&B and hip-hop Thank world. You. and Thank you. Friendship. It's been a pleasure. It's, Thank you. It's absolutely, you, know, you, don't, you don't understand the name of it. Thank you. Thank you.